Okay, so let's get started. Tonight we're going to talk about MOSFETs. This is a different type of transistor, so we're going to talk a little bit about those, but we're going to start with a review of Class C amplifiers. Um, then we're going to go on to lectures. We're going to talk about what is a MOSFET, why do we care about them, um, and what's inside of them. So we'll see a little bit about how they work, just like we saw how diodes work and how transistors work, BJTs. We're going to see how MOSFETs work a little bit also. Then we'll do a quick preview of tonight's lab. Tonight you're going to be building a circuit with a MOSFET, um, and you're going to uh, do a characterization. So you're going to see how the MOSFET responds under different voltages. Okay? So we'll talk about that. Any questions before we get going? Yeah. Earl has a question. Last you guys, I've got to set the sheet out today. We're over there today and somewhere in here on Wednesday getting help. Could you please sign up before you take off? Okay. Tonight or whatever those that were either way. Just so I can have it to turn in. Okay, thanks. So, thanks. All right. Anything else? Cool. So then let's start with a quick review of class C amplifier. So last time we built class C amplifier, what we found was that they were extremely efficient, but they only worked for a very narrow band of frequencies, right? So this was good for things like amplifying radio signals because that's exactly what you want. You want to be very efficient because your radio signal is extremely small, so you need to do a very good job of amplifying that. And you also want to amplify only a very narrow band of frequencies. You want to listen to the radio station that you're interested in and not all the neighboring stations. So class C amplifiers are very good for applications like radio. So, um, any questions about that? We saw that the heart of a class C amplifier was a special kind of circuit that had an inductor in parallel with a capacitor. You guys remember what this circuit was called? Tank circuit. Tank circuit. Tank circuit. That's right. Exactly. So the way that the tank circuit worked was that you started off with a bunch of charge on one side of the capacitor, and then that charge was connected to the other side through this inductor. So that charge started to migrate over to the other side of the capacitor. And it started flowing and it, um, eventually it got moving pretty fast through that inductor and then the charges evened out so that you had the same charge on the top and the bottom of that capacitor. But at that point, the current was flowing really fast through this inductor. And we found that once the current was moving through this inductor, it wanted to continue the inductor wanted to make that current continue to move. So it forced that current to keep flowing, so it, it kept drawing electrons off the top of this capacitor and piling them on the bottom. So it just kept doing that, and eventually you got a big pile up of electrons of charge down at the bottom of this capacitor. And uh, that was pushing back in the other direction, so eventually that evened out and it, it caused the electrons to stop flowing through this inductor, but by that time you had a big pile up down here, so they were pushing back in the other direction. So you kept getting this oscillation back and forth from the capacitor through the inductor back to the capacitor. Okay. And that oscillation happened at a very predictable rate. We had that formula for the, the frequency of the oscillation, right? Uh, so if you know the size of the capacitor and the size of the inductor, you can figure out the oscillation frequency for the tank circuit. Or if you know what oscillation frequency you want, you can choose an inductor and a capacitor that will give you that oscillation frequency. So we said that the tank circuit is pretty cool, but of course, in the real world, it's going to lose a little bit of energy each time that this cycle happens, that each time that the electrons go from one side to the other, because there's a little bit of resistance in the wires and the inductor, and so 
if it were just left to its own devices, it would oscillate, but then it would quickly die out. So the class C amplifier provides a little bit of extra boost to this oscillation. It, when, when all the electrons are over on this side, it just gives it a few extra electrons, piles on a few more. Um, and so it keeps that oscillation going. So another way to think of that is that it, it amplifies those signals that, that are boosting this oscillation. And the signals that are coming at, at uh, other frequencies that don't match up with the oscillation frequency of the tank circuit, those other signals are diminished. So it amplifies the signals that are at the same frequency as this tank circuit. So that's how the tank circuit works, and that's why the class C amplifier really works only for that very narrow band of frequencies that are at the same uh, resonance as the tank circuit. Questions about that? Okay, cool. So that's a little bit about class C amplifiers. So today, we're going to talk about MOSFETs. So you might say, what is a MOSFET? Well, a MOSFET is a special type of transistor. Okay. So we saw BJTs before, bipolar junction transistors, that was another type. MOSFETs, MOSFET stands for metal oxide silicon field effect transistor. So this is another type of transistor, just like the BJT was a type of transistor. What makes MOSFETs special is that they use voltage to control current. Okay. We saw that BJTs used a small amount of current to control a large current. So with BJTs, current controlled current. With MOSFETs, voltage controls current. Okay. Um, the symbol for a BJ or for a MOSFET, I'm sorry, looks something like this. This has three terminals, just like a BJT had three terminals, but the names of these terminals are different. So this is called the gate, this is called the drain, and this is called the source. that's what a MOSFET is. It's a, a special type of transistor where the voltage controls the current. And it has these terminals, the gate, the drain, and the source. Now you might say, why would we care? Why would we use MOSFETs? We already have BJTs, right? Why not just stick with those? Well, BJTs were, were cool, but they had some drawbacks, right? Um, since we were using current to control current, you, you still needed to, that, that was actually a limitation, right? If you wanted to use a microcontroller, say, um, to drive a BJT, a microcontroller can supply about 20 milliamps through one pin. So if you were using that to drive a BJT and you had a, a 100 uh, times amplification from that BJT, you could drive 100 times more than 20 milliamps. So that would be 
about two amps. So that's pretty good, you know, that can run a, a small size motor, but it's not, it's not huge, right? With MOSFETs, you're using voltage to control current. So you can use a small voltage out of the uh, microcontroller and, and use practically no current at all. So you only have to supply voltage. And that voltage could drive a much, much larger amount of current. So you could use you know, two or three volts to drive you know, 10 amps or, or 50 amps. So you are able, the fact that you're able to use voltage to control the current is, is actually a big plus. Okay. MOSFETs are also the type of transistors that are found on silicon chips primarily. So when you have a, a phone or a computer chip that has lots and lots of transistors inside of it, MOSFETs are the type of transistors that they typically use. Okay. So these are found in, in chips, they're found in memory as well, you know, computer memory. So, so these are ubiquitous, and so it's important to know how they work. So that's what they are. That's a little bit about why we care about them and why they're important. So let's talk about what's inside of these guys. Okay. So if you were to cut one of these open and look at it with a microscope, what you would see is something like this. It would be three pieces of silicon sandwiched together, just like we had before. You might have an N, a P, and an N. But the difference is that whereas with the BJT, you had a, a wire connected directly to the, the P uh, silicon, what happens here is that there's actually a small piece of glass that is connected and, and laid onto the, the middle part of the silicon. And this glass is then, there's a, a metal plate on the, the other side of the glass, and there's a wire connected to that metal plate. So this wire doesn't actually touch the middle chunk of silicon. It gets close, but it's separated by this insulating layer of glass. So that's why there's almost no current that flows. Um, this is the gate. So there's almost no current that flows from the gate into the transistor because you've got this layer of glass that insulates the gate from the silicon. So, I drew the silicon um, with an NPN configuration, and when you have a MOSFET with this configuration, this is called an N channel MOSFET. So an N-channel MOSFET corresponds to an NPN type BJT. And this is the symbol for an N-channel MOSFET. Now, with BJTs, we could have either an NPN configuration or a PNP configuration. And the same is true for MOSFETs, but it has a slightly different name, okay? So, if we have a MOSFET where you have P, N, P, 
e silicon sandwich, then this is called a p channel MOSFET. And the symbol for a P-channel MOSFET looks a little bit different. So, um, it's very similar, but the, the arrow points in the other direction. This is a P channel. Awesome. So you know how we said with NPN transistors, the mnemonic was that um, it never points inwards, right? The, the arrow always points out. Well, with MOSFETs, it's just the opposite. So <laughs> it makes it a little bit harder to remember. But um, with MOSFETs, the, the arrow for an N channel does point inwards, OK? So it's kind of backwards to what we were used to. Um, but that's, that's just the way that it is. Yeah. Is there a lower current limit? You said that basically it's a certain level. Is there a lower current that is required to operate that or to control that? Or is that by, by device or they kind of created that way? Um, the, you mean how much current goes into the gate in order to control it? How much is required? You oh. said it's, it's controlled by voltage. Right. I mean, it's. it's yeah, it's essentially. I think it's in the micro amps. I mean, it, it's almost negligible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So since we use voltage to control current, we have a special name for this type of operation. We call this transconductance. Um, trans usually means that um, one thing um, controlling something or, or changing to something else. So this is a change between voltage and current. So voltage is uh, controlling current here. So um, this is a transconductance device. And it actually, we can draw something called a transconductance curve for this type of device, and that relates the voltage to the amount of current that is flowing through our device. Okay. So let me draw you an example of that down here. Does anybody need a little more time to copy down the pictures? All right. start with a circuit. Let's imagine that we had a circuit like you're going to build in your lab. Okay? So we've got a an N channel MOSFET. got a resistor and then we got a power source. Okay. 
Okay. So this is a one of ohm resistor. And this goes down to ground. And we're applying some voltage over here to the gate. Remember, this is the gate, the drain, and the source. So we're applying some voltage to the gate, and we're going to have some current flowing from our power source through the drain to the source of our transistor and then down to ground. Okay. Um, so let's think about this for a minute. Let's think about the maximum amount of current that this circuit will allow to flow from the, the drain uh, or from our, our power supply down to ground. Okay. If this transistor were acting just like a wire, then essentially we would have a circuit like this, right, where we had 15 volts up here and one kilo ohm down there. So how much current could we get flowing through this circuit if it were hooked up just like that? Yeah, 15 milliamps, right? So if this transistor behaves just like a wire, then we would get a maximum of 15 milliamps flowing through the circuit. So we're never going to get more than 15 milliamps flowing through this particular circuit, right? So that's the maximum that we can handle, or that this circuit will, will allow. So what we can do is we can plot something called a transconductance curve. Um, and this shows the amount of current that flows through our circuit versus the amount of voltage. So this is current, and this is voltage that's applied to the gate. So if we looked at this, um, this is the voltage between the gate and the source. What we would see, we know the maximum amount of current that could possibly flow through this device, right? We just said that that was 15 milliamps. So we're never going to get more than 15 milliamps, but this transistor can limit the amount of current that we get. So if we have no voltage between the gate and the source, we're going to get no current. So we're going to be down here somewhere. As we start applying voltage between the gate and the source, we're going to see that our current increases. So you keep adding more and more voltage. You'll keep getting more and more current until you reach this limit, right? Again, you could apply as much voltage as you want to that gate. The transistor is never going to be better than a wire. So you're never going to get more current than 15 milliamps. But you will see um, a curve that looks something like this. Okay? So this, this relates how much voltage you apply between the gate and the source to how much current you get through the drain. Any questions about that? Start up until ah, right. So that's a good question. Before, when we were looking at BJTs, we had to have 0.7 volts between the gate and the source in order for the current to start flowing, right? Because the there was sort of a a um, diode effect between the gate and the source. Essentially, it was a diode. So. We needed that 0.7 volts because that was how much it took to allow current to flow from the um, from the uh, the base to the collector in our BJTs. But 
since the current is not flowing from the gate to the source here, you don't have that 0.7 volts to overcome. So really, as soon as you start applying voltage, you should see some current start to flow. So that's another reason that these devices are, are um, preferred over EJTs. Okay. That being said, there are some drawbacks. The most notable drawback is that these devices are very sensitive to static electricity. Okay? They're, they're controlled by voltage, right? And the voltage in the little shock that you get from, from walking across the carpet and touching a door handle, that's actually extremely high. It's in the tens of thousands of volts, if not hundreds of thousands of volts. Right? It's a very small amount of current, so it doesn't hurt you, but it's very, very high voltage. And since these are devices that are controlled by voltage, it, they're very, very sensitive to that type of static electricity. It doesn't even have to be as much as you would get from walking across a carpet. Just wearing the wrong type of clothing and, and swishing your legs together can generate enough static to damage these types of transistors. So when you have a factory that's either manufacturing these devices or using MOSFETs in, um, as part of another assembly, people have to take a lot of precautions to avoid static electricity. You have to wear special wrist straps. You have to have the carts grounded to the floor. There's all kinds of stuff that you have to do to be careful when you're handling these so that you make sure that you avoid static electricity. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that so much in this class. We've chosen some MOSFETs that are pretty bomb-proof, okay? So um, it's not so much of a concern here, but you should know that if you go out and start working with MOSFETs in the real world, that's definitely something that you have to be careful about, okay? So any questions about that? Just a quick aside, the voltages between any two terminals are denoted by the, the first letters of the, those terminals. So, for instance, down here I was denoting the voltage between the gate and the source. So that's VGS. Okay? Um, if I had looked at the voltage between the drain and the source, that would be VDS. Okay? The voltages at any particular terminal are denoted by uh, v and then two of the same letters. So if I was looking at the voltage at a gate, I would say VGG. If I was looking at the voltage on the drain, I would say VDD. If I was looking at the voltage at the source, I would say VSS. So you guys may have looked at some printed circuit boards before. You may have seen schematics where they talk about VDD or VSS. VDD is normally the power, right? and VSS is normally the ground. It's labeled that way on the little board of education that you guys used in 302. Um, five volts is labeled as VDD, zero volts is VSS. Well, that's where this come, where that notation comes from. Okay. You're talking about the voltage at the drain of little transistors inside the circuit and the voltage at the source. So that's where that notation comes from. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's it's very much the same. Um, I believe that, so the, the way that the N-channel MOSFET works is that the um, voltage at the gate has to be higher than the voltage at the source. I believe that the, for a P-channel MOSFET, the voltage at the gate has to be lower than the voltage at the source in order to get, to allow the current to flow. So just like with the um, BJT, at the end channel MOSFET, you had to have a higher voltage to get the current to flow. Or with, I'm sorry, with the, an NPN MOSFET, you had to have a higher voltage at the base in order to make the current flow through to the collector, whereas with the, the PNP, you had to have a lower voltage at the... Uh, <coughs> 
at the base to allow the, the current to flow through. Um, it, it's a similar situation here. Whenever I switch over from talking about um, BJTs to MOSFETs, it always takes me a minute to, to remember whether I'm talking about gate drain source or emitter base collector. So um, it, it always takes me a minute to remember the, the correct terminology there. So if I'm pausing, that's what I'm thinking about. Okay. So questions about that? Okay. So then let's talk a little bit about the lab. Let's do a quick review of today's lab. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to build essentially this circuit. Okay? You're going to control the input voltage with a potentiometer. So you'll control the input voltage like that. And then you'll have a meter here to measure the current. through the drain, and also a meter to measure the voltage at the gate. Okay? And you're going to adjust your potentiometer to, an, and you're going to look for a certain amount of current. So you're going to adjust the potentiometer until you get uh, one milliamp flowing through the drain and then you're going to record the voltage in a table. And then you're going to adjust the, the potentiometer again until you get 2 milliamps. You're going to record the voltage um, 3, 5, 8, and so on. You're going to record a number of different voltages. And you're going to write them down. And then you're going to plot out your results on a graph. Okay. Um, so you're going to make your own transconductance curve. This is called the Trans conductance curve. So you're going to plot that out in your lab book. For the next part of the lab, you're going to have a very similar circuit, except instead of using a potentiometer to create the voltage over here, you're going to use the function generator to create the voltage. So you're going to create a triangle wave voltage. and you're going to hook this up and you're going to have a diode up here. So you should see the diode going on and off. Um, and you're going to measure the voltage at the gate and also the voltage at the drain. Okay. So you're going to see that as the, the gate voltage changes, the, the drain voltage changes as well. So let's, let's imagine this. Let's take a look at how this might turn out. So your input voltage is here. It's going to be a triangle wave that goes between 0 and 10 volts. Okay. So when you have zero volts here at the gate, is this MOSFET going to be conducting any electricity? No, it's not, right? It's going to be acting like an open circuit. So essentially, it's like there's no connection between um, the bottom of this resistor and ground. So is there going to be any voltage or any, any current there's not going to be any current flowing 
through that resistor. So is this voltage at the bottom of the resistor going to be high or low? What, what's that voltage going to be right there? Mm, no? Low. No? Oh, no, sorry. High. high. Great. It's going to be high. There's going to be, it's like there's no connection between this resistor and ground. So this resistor is just going to be at the same voltage as our source. So that resistor voltage right there, um, which we're going to measure with the scope, this voltage is going to be high. So when, when the, our input voltage is low, the, the voltage at the drain, so this would be V, D, S, that's going to be high. Okay. What's that? The diode? Uh, no, it won't have an effect because there's not going to be any current flowing through that resistor at all. So, yeah. So, um, so that's just going to be at about 15 volts. Okay. Now. Let's imagine what happens when we have a maximum voltage going in. So we've got 10 volts going in there. How much voltage are we going to see um, at the drain? So 10 volts, this MOSFET acts like a wire. Okay? The whole thing is um, conducting a lot of electricity. So essentially, it's, it's like a wire with the drain connected directly to ground. So how much voltage would we see there? Um, no, it should be it should be about zero volts, right? If this if this um, MOSFET is acting just like a wire, then that drain will be connected directly to ground. So that should be. Um, very low voltage. Maybe not entirely zero, but um, very low. If it was acting completely like a wire, then we would see exactly zero volts there. Um, if it's still got a little bit of resistance, then it wouldn't be quite zero. But um, we're going to see something like that. So basically, the, the voltage between the, the drain and the source is going to go like this. It's going to be high every time the input voltage is low, and it'll be low every time the input voltage is high. So it's going to sort of mirror the input voltage. Questions about that? It doesn't go back all the way down to zero? It, it may, um, depending on exactly how much um, voltage it takes to completely turn this transistor on, it, it may go down to zero. Um, in, in fact, yeah, depending on, on how uh, steep this is, it, it may look something more like this. It may be, you know, up here for a while and then go down and then back up and go down. So it, it may actually end up being something like that. Okay. So, so you should uh, hook that up and, and look at your input and your output and draw that. In part four, there are actually two different circuits that are shown. Um, you only have to construct the one that's on the left-hand side of the page. Okay, so on page 83, there's two circuits drawn. You only have to build the one that's on the left-hand side. Really, the only difference is that the left-hand side is using a triangle wave, the right-hand side is using a square wave. But you can just cross off the one on the right-hand side. You only have to build the one on the left. Okay.
And that's it, really. So did you guys have any questions about the lab there? OK, then let me take roll, and I'll let you get to it.